Okay, so in the previous videos, we've taken a look at supply, we've taken a look at demand, that is going to be our marginal cost, our marginal benefit, alternatively minimum willingness to accept, maximum willingness to pay. Well, what we're going to be doing today, we're going to be taking these concepts, we're going to be bringing them together to get this idea of the market. And we'll take a look at what we mean by the market, and ultimately the big point in this is how prices are determined, that determination of price. And... Really, the big reason why this is relevant, I mean, if we think about the world around us, quite often we get con um, ideas, concepts coming up like, hey, our current wage is too low. Minimum wage is too low, it ought to be higher. Or, hey, housing is too expensive. Well, implicit in that is that those are normative statements, that you have this view that pricing of housing is too high, that your price of your wage is too low, but what ought these prices to be, right? Can you actually create a positive argument that is a fact-based argument, that's not just your opinions, as to what the price of housing ought to be, as to what the wage should be, right? And we'll see that sometimes, right, if we get these normative statements for housing, for wages, that we might end up in worse situations given our drive to enforce these. So we'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at a few different examples. Um, those cases where we're going to start to like force changes, that's going to be more in a future video, which will be labeled price controls. For this video, though, specifically, we're going to be looking at that determination of price, that determination of quantity exchanged. So as we go through today's video, what we're going to be taking a look at, first, we're going to explain that adjustment process from disequilibrium to equilibrium. So, okay, I should say probably before that, before we even get to that, First, we're going to figure out what equilibrium even means. We're going to define that term equilibrium. Then once we have an idea as to what equilibrium is, well, then we'll explain how our market can adjust from a disequilibrium to an equilibrium. From here, we're going to identify and we're going to compute. So we're going to do some math here. We're going to compute the equilibrium price and quantity exchanged. And then finally, we're going to identify a new equilibrium following a shock. We're going to utilize what's known as comparative statics. We're going to change, we're going to shock those determinants of supply and demand that we had looked at in previous videos. And then following the shocks to those, we're going to analyze what happens to the market price, what happens to the market quantity exchanged. So let's move on. Let's take a look at the actual, what we're going to be covering today. So first thing, right, just keep in mind is that all of our analysis, everything we're doing here is being done cetris paribus. Right. And OK, this is the third time at least now that I've brought this up. And again, what we mean by Cetris Paribus is that we're holding everything else in the world constant. So that is when we draw our supply and demand diagrams, we're drawing supply, we're drawing demand, we're representing this market for a fixed population. We're drawing this market for a fixed level of income or fixed price of other goods, fixed expectations on and on and on, right? We go through all 12 of our determinants, six for demand, six for supply. We are presuming that all of those are fixed. The only one implicitly changing, again, I keep using that, the only one explicitly changing is going to be the change in own price. And that's because when we draw our supply curve as we draw our demand curve, well, these curves are drawn for a change in own price, right? Just let's take a look at that. Let's see, right? You're like, whoa, what, what's going on? Okay, so we have our axes. We have price. We have quantity. And let's suppose we wanted to represent our demand curve. Well, as we represent our demand curve, it is re being represented for a change in price, resulting in a change in quantity demanded for all of our other determinants being held constant right so there would be our demand and right this would be for a fixed change in price of other fixed income right we're not we're not having change in other prices we're not having changes in income we're not having changes in expectations population etc, 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 right? All of our determinants of demand are fixed. They're not moving around. The only one in here that is changing is the change in own price. Outside of that, everything else is fixed. So, okay, 
let's let's just finish this guy off, right? Our last one here that we didn't put in is tastes, tastes and preferences. So, right, we're not having changes in tastes. All of these are fixed in drawing of this demand curve. Similarly, if we were to draw our supply curve, well, if we were to draw our supply curve, same idea. It's just the price that is changing, right? Everything else, all of these other determinants are being held constant. So let's just draw that in here. So there's our supply being brought in. And this is being drawn for a fixed change in price of others, right? So this is our complements, our substitutes of production. Those are all fixed in the representation of this supply curve. Ah, they have price of inputs. Price of inputs are all fixed. These guys aren't changing around either. Right. Very similarly, what else do we have? We have technology. So technology is fixed. This is being drawn for a fixed level of technology. And we have number of suppliers being fixed as well. Right. This is kind of the supply side of population. We also have expectations. So our suppliers, our producers' expectations, they're constant. They're not changing. So in this sense here, the only thing that's changing is we draw this supply curve is change in price of own good. Okay, so we have that drawn. We have our market being shown here as we have supply equals demand. Okay, one of the big assumptions, and again, I brought this assumption up earlier, but again, just to make sure, this is probably again the third time I brought up this assumption, should be kind of hint that these are important things. So, okay, our assumption here, our key assumption is that this market, this supply and this demand, this is representing a market that has lots of small homogenous producers and consumers, right? So that is in the demand side, we have lots of small homogenous people all demanding this good. So, okay, lots means that there's millions of them. Small means that you, your demand for this good is a drop in the bucket. If you decided just you're the only one, you changed your tastes, the market wouldn't notice that. You're too small to have any influence on the market individually. And homogenous, well, okay, that kind of goes against that. You are the only one to have an impact. But the homogenous is just kind of an easy way that we can have to aggregate up to say, hey, you are the same as everybody else. So whatever changes for you changes for everybody. And yeah, that goes in conflict with what we just said. Nah, we're kind of trying to look at it from different examples here. From the producer side, well, what's going on there? Again, lots of small homogenous producers. So again, homogenous, they're all the same. Small, meaning that any one firm has no influence on the over mark, overall market. And as a result, we just have this massive amount with no one firm being able to influence anything. So big assumptions being made. Okay, from this, what we ultimately end up getting is we get equilibrium. And we need to define, oh, that's not the right tool. Let's try that again. We need to define this term of equilibrium. Equilibrium, this is something that we kind of borrow from the natural sciences. And in order to define equilibrium, the best kind of thing to do is to say that this kind of means that all forces are in balance, right? And so when you're talking about gravity, when you're talking about any of these other kind of forces in the natural world, equilibrium occurs when they are all in balance, right? It's kind of like that whole law of motion that, hey, something will stay still until an outside force acts upon it. Same kind of idea with these markets here. This market will be perfectly happy staying right here, just as we have it, giving us some price, some quantity exchanged, until some outside force acts upon it. As soon as that outside force acts upon it, we get into a momentary disequilibrium, the forces balance themselves out, and we re-equalize, right? The classic kind of thing is, imagine you are, you're standing there, right? And you're standing there, and all of a sudden, your friend comes along, Maybe they're not a great friend, who knows? And they push you. Well, okay, as they push you, you stumble around, right? You're like, oh no, I've lost my balance. You've lost your equilibrium. And you're stumbling about a little bit, but that's short lived, that's only momentary. And eventually you now refine your new balance, your new equilibrium at a new spot, 
right? You've stumbled a few steps forward, but you regain your equilibrium, you regain your balance. Same kind of idea with the market. It's gonna be here, just standing there, minding its own business. All of a sudden, something comes along, gives it a little shove. Okay, we have a little shove. We stumble a little bit, we move, and then we re-find this equilibrium, we re-find this point of balance. So, okay, let's start off and take a look then. Oh, let's take a look at where this initial equilibrium is. So initial equilibrium, right where supply equals demand, we're gonna get our market price. So right there, that is the determination of the market price. On the other side, we are gonna have our market quantity exchanged. Okay, so there we go. I can point to this, I can say, woo, this is our equilibrium, but it leaves a lot of questions, right? It leaves a lot of questions as to why this is our equilibrium, why we aren't in equilibrium at say another point, right? What's so special about this one? Sure, we see that the lines cross, but maybe that's just a construct, right? Just an artifact of the way we've drawn it. Maybe it's not actually relevant to um, a balancing point. So let's take a look at these market forces that are in play, and let's take a look at why this actually ought to be an equilibrium. So let's back up. Let's get rid of this price and quantity exchanged. And let's take a look at a situation. Let's suppose that we had a price that was too high. So we had a price up here. I'll call this, I'll call this PH for price high. At this high price, well, high price, I'm gonna have, based off of that, drawing down, I'm gonna have this amount of quantity being demanded, right? High price, eh, I don't really wanna buy too much. At the same time, high price, all my firms are gonna be enticed to produce a lot so I'm gonna have this amount of quantity supplied. And right, we could say, I don't know, just to give it some context, maybe this is the market for t-shirts. So right now we have a really high price of t-shirts. You're saying, yeah, you know what? I don't know if I really need another t-shirt given that high price. Producers of t-shirts go, whoa, I can get that price for a t-shirt? I'm gonna to try to produce as many as I can. Here's the problem. We have a discrepancy. You only wanna buy this many, the firm wants to produce this many. Between the two, what's going to be our actual quantity exchanged? That is, what is actually going to be bought and sold in this market? Right? And we can give them some numbers. Let's say that altogether, everybody in the market only wants to buy 30 t shirts a month. Right? And that's just not you, that's not one person. This is everybody, say in BC, they're only buying 30 t shirts a month. But all of our t-shirt producers at this high price, they're wanting to make something like a thousand t-shirts a month. Okay, cool. They're making a thousand. You and I are only buying 30. What is actually being exchanged in this market? Well, what's actually being exchanged is the amount being bought. So in this case here, we can always kind of explain, we can always kind of link our quantity exchanged will always be the minimum of either the quantity demanded or the quantity supplied, right? It doesn't matter that we're making a thousand t-shirts. We only want to buy 30 at this high price. So 30 would be our quantity exchanged. Okay, so what, what, what happens? What do we do, right? We have this problem. We have this overproduction of t-shirts and we're not buying them. Okay, keep in mind why these firms, why these producers of t-shirts are in business to start with, right? They're not in business because they love making t-shirts. Maybe they like t-shirts. Maybe they actually do get some enjoyment out of making t-shirts, but that's not the reason they're in business. They're in business to maximize their profit. They're in business to make money, right? Maximizing their profit. Can they maximize their profit if they're not selling these t-shirts? Right? It's not like, oh, wow, I really like having boxes of t-shirts sitting in my garage. No, 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 no. They want to get rid of these. So what happens is they look, they go, wow, we got all these t-shirts. We got 970 t-shirts, which are not being sold, right? Where did that 970 come from? Well, 970, that's the difference between these two. This would be all of my excess supply all the excess supply that I produced but was not able to sell, I'd have 970 t-shirts of excess supply. 
So what do I begin to do with these? Right? I don't want them in my garage. I don't want them just sitting in boxes and storerooms. I want to get rid of them. I want to sell them. I wanted to sell them for pH, price high, but clearly that's not happening. So what do I do? Well, I go put them on the clearance rack. I go put them up for sale. So I begin to, I begin to lower the price. So I drop the price a little bit. As I drop the price, so we'll call this pH prime, right? It's our new price high. At this new pH prime, well, my quantity demanded has increased, right? At this new lower price, I'm willing to buy more t-shirts. Problem is, right, as we move forward in future production runs, I'm now looking at this and saying, okay, yeah, I couldn't sell all my t-shirts here. I was able to sell more of them when I dropped the price. So in the future, well, maybe this is more realistic on my price. I'm not going to produce a thousand t-shirts. Problem is, right, we still have, we still have this here as our excess supply. We still have more supply than we have wanting to be purchased. So we still have our same problem. So we carry on. We do another, we do another sale. We put them on like final clearance. And as we go through that, we lower the price once again. Oh, maybe that's a bit too low. Let's go. Oh, there we go. So we've lowered the price again. And at this case here, we now have a situation where right there, we have quantity demanded equal to quantity supplied, right? Price over quantity supplied, quantity demanded are right at the same point. So at this point here, hey, I don't have excess supply. I don't have any incentive to lower my price in order to sell it. So I'm happy. I'm producing the right amount. Everything that I produced was able to be sold. I got my price matched right. We're good. There's no market force pushing down the price in this case. So we're good. We're balanced once more. Okay, a little bit of a thought thing here. In this scenario, we had a case of excess supply. In the case of excess supply, who facilitated the pushing down of the price? Was it the consumer, you and I, the demander of t-shirts? Or was it the producer, the one making t-shirts? Who facilitated that downward pressure in prices? Well, keep in mind in this case here, it was the producer. The producer was sitting on all this excess product that they couldn't sell at their initial price. As a result, what they did is they began to push the price down, push the price down until they arrived at a point where the amount supplied was equal to the amount demanded. So in a case of excess supply, it is the supplier that pushes down the price. Okay, let's take a look at the other side. What happens if we have a low price? So let's presume that we start off with a low price, something down over here. So we have a really, really low price of t-shirts now. At this really low price, well, you and I, we're going, wow, t-shirts are cheap. I'm going to load up. I'm going to buy a whole bunch of them. And we get the quantity demanded, the amount of t-shirts that we're wanting to buy at this price. Problem is, at this low price, firms are going, yeah, okay, low price. Some firms are able to produce or they're willing to produce a little bit. But, well... We have a very low quantity supply. So, okay, this here would be the case where, say, we want to buy 100 t-shirts. Firms only want to make 20. So, right in this case here, we would have all of this excess demand. right? And in this case here, we would have an excess demand of 80 t-shirts. The 100 that we demand versus the 20 being supplied. Once again, we have this discrepancy. What is the actual quantity exchanged? How many t-shirts are actually bought and sold in this market? Well, it doesn't matter if we want to buy 100, if only 20 exist, right? So in this case here, again, it is the lesser of the two that becomes our quantity exchanged. So this guy here, this is our quantity exchange, the amount that would actually be bought or sold in this market. Well, so what's our market force? What is happening here? Why is this a disequilibrium? Well, in this case, you really want a t-shirt, right? You were willing to buy 100 t-shirts at this price. There are 80 t-shirts of excess demand. 
you are just looking to get maybe a t-shirt now, but everybody's looking to get a t-shirt at this price and they're very difficult to find, right? It's really hard to find a t-shirt. So you finally find a shop that has a t-shirt, but there's a lineup, right? There's a whole bunch of people who have t-shirts. Maybe somebody's buying t-shirts and like, just because it was cheap price, they don't even want t-shirts. They're just buying them. Well, how do you get a t-shirt? How do you ensure that you can actually get this t-shirt that you want? Well, the one way is that you begin to bid up the price. You begin to say, hey, hey, I really need a shirt. I will be willing to pay a higher price in order to guarantee that I can get a shirt. So you bid up the price. Maybe you buy this from somebody who has already bought it. Essentially, what begins to happen is that you begin to bid up. You begin to push up this market price of t-shirts. As this market price of t-shirts gets bid up, well, your quantity demanded falls at this higher price across the market. People are not wanting as many t-shirts anymore. So, okay, we have less quantity demanded for t-shirts. And then what happens is our firms, they begin to realize, hey, wait, they're rebuying t-shirts between themselves at this higher price. Why don't we just sell them initially at this higher price? So firms react and firms push up the price that they're initially listing t-shirts at. And they, as a result, also ramp up their production. So higher price, our amount demanded falls. Higher price, the amount produced rises. And we have our new price, which is a little bit higher than the old one. But keep in mind, right, again, we still have a little bit of excess demand. So we respond to this excess demand. Again, I can't find a shirt. So how do I get one? Well, I'm willing to push up the price of a shirt a little bit. As I'm willing to push up the price of a shirt, well, okay, again, this keeps going, keeps going, and I wind up at, I missed it again by a little bit. There we go. Push up the price of a shirt, and I end up at my equilibrium. Here I have my new price, and I'm going to have my quantity such that right at this point here, Price to demand gives me my quantity demanded. Price to supply gives me my quantity supplied. The two are one and the same. The amount produced, the amount supplied to the market is one and the same as the amount that you and I want to buy, the amount demanded. So we have no more excess demand and we have an equilibrium. There's no longer any market force to push up the price, right? You're not going to go to the store and go, hey, there's t-shirts there. Everybody's good to buy a t-shirt. They're listed for 20 bucks, but I'm going to give you 25 just to make sure I get it. No, no, you wouldn't do that unless you needed to guarantee that you could get a shirt because they were in such short supply. So in this case here, because there's no longer a shortage of t-shirts, there's no longer this upward price pressure, and we are once again in an equilibrium. So again, same kind of follow-up question. Started off in a case of excess demand. Who pushed up the price in this scenario? Was it the supplier or was it the demander? Well, again, in this case here, excess demand. It was the demander, the individual who wanted the t-shirt, who began to push up the price. They, because they really, really wanted this good, were willing to pay more and more and more for it, raising the market price altogether until that market force arrived at a new equilibrium such that we no longer had any discrepancy between our supplied and demanded amounts. This actually flies in the face of a lot of common belief, right? And this really flies in the face of a situation such as if we were to talk about rentals. Right? Especially here in the greater Victoria area, a lot of people believe that the price of rent is too high and many people blame the landlord for charging too much for rent. But okay, keep in mind, who pushes up the price? Is it the landlord all of a sudden being like, I'm just going to push up the price and see if I can get away with this? Or is it the individuals who are showing up to the open houses and beginning to outbid each other to ensure that they get the rental over the next person? because they want a place to live and there's such an excess demand for rentals versus the supply available. There's so much extra demand for rentals that the tenants, the potential tenants at least, begin to outbid each other, pushing up the price. As they do this, 
as that price of rents creeps up, other landlords go, wow, you got this price for your place? Clearly, that's now the market rental price. And prices adjust upwards because the demanders bid them up. So thing to keep in mind with that, right? It's always fun to point to the landlords and say, wow, they're just profiteering off of this. But put yourself in that other case. Say you were the landlord, you had a whole bunch of tenants, and they were saying, hey, hey, no, 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 I'll give you an extra 100 bucks a month if you give it to me over them. I'll give you an extra 300 a month if you give it to me over them. Are you going to go, oh, no, 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 don't worry. I'm just going to take it as it is. No, no, right? You're in, this is your business, right? You are a landlord. You are offering your capital, your investment, and you're trying to maximize your profit off of this. So if they're trying to offer you more money for your good, you're going to say, yeah, okay, thank you. Sure, I'll give it to you at this higher price. Both parties are happy. The one party gets the rental that they were demanding, and the other party gets to actually sell their good. So in this case here, again, to reiterate, the demander pushes up that price. Okay, so we've taken a look at equilibrium. We've taken a look at this whole adjustment from equilibrium, sorry, from disequilibrium to equilibrium. Let's take a look at mathematically then how we can solve for this. Let's take a look at that. So let's suppose that we have the following equations. We have a supply equation. We have a demand equation, and they're listed as price equals 10 plus quantity supply. For my demand, I'm going to have price equals 90 minus 3 quantity demanded. Now, keep in mind, first example, I'm giving them to you purposefully in this format to be very clear. Right? I'm listing, here's my supply, 10 plus quantity supplied. I'm saying here's my demand, price equals 90 minus 3, quantity demanded. I could just as easily, though, have given them to you just strictly consider the following demand and supply equations represented as price equals 10 plus Q, price equals 90 minus 3Q. And right, I don't, I don't have supply, I don't have demand in front of these. I have nothing kind of saying, hey, which one's which? You have to kind of discern that for yourself. And how, how exactly would you do that? Well, okay, keep in mind, if we go back to our videos on supply, we go back to our videos on demand, supply is upward sloping, that is, it has a positive slope. Well, okay, positive slope plus Q, that's a positive slope, so that's upward sloping. Demand, demand is downward sloping, that is a negative slope, right there, negative 3Q. So this guy would be our demand function. First thing we would want to do, right? So we say, okay, here's the functional form for supply. Here's the functional form for demand. What is our equilibrium price? What is our equilibrium quantity exchanged? And graph this. So, okay, we could just solve it. I'm visual. I like to graph it first. So let's take a look at that. We have our vertical axes. Let's try that again. Let's get it straight. There we go. And our horizontal axes. Price goes on the vertical, quantity goes on the horizontal. And for me, I like to start with my demand curve first. So to start off with my demand curve, I have my vertical intercept of 90. Now let's just put that somewhere like that. Okay, 90. And then from here, I am dropping. So 90, let's use blue for demand. And I'm dropping as such. I will then have a horizontal intercept. Well, can I figure this horizontal intercept out? We could resolve this as something like Q equals MP, I guess minus MP plus B, and figure out what B is as that guy. But a little bit of an easier trick that we can utilize is if we just take our vertical intercept and divide it by the magnitude of the slope, so that is if we just go 90 over 3, 90 over 3 gives us 30. That will be our horizontal intercept. So if we don't need to have the other form, we don't need to go through all that algebra, we can just do a quick little cheat, and we can get our other one there. So I have my demand curve, right? And actually label it that this is our demand, D for demand. We could also call it our marginal benefit or our maximum willingness to pay, but we'll refer to it as demand in this case. 
Okay, what about my next one? Well, my next one that I want to take a look at is my supply. So we don't need a perfect scale, but we'll try to get it rough. So if that's 90, I don't know, maybe something like that. That would be my 10. And, okay, pause of soap, I'm going up. Again, we don't need to get it perfect, but what we should recognize is that my demand had a slope of negative 3. This guy implicitly in front of this Q, even though it's not there, there's technically a 1. So between the two, my demand is steeper, my supply is shallower, right? Bigger number, steeper line. Smaller number, shallower line. So as I go to draw this supply curve, starting from my vertical intercept, it's going to be a little bit shallower. I don't know if that's exactly a slope of one given my scale, but we're just trying to get the relative kind of fit with this. From here, I should now just identify where my equilibrium is going to be. So where supply equals demand, I'm going to have my equilibrium quantity and my equilibrium price. These values are what I'm next going to solve for. But now that I graphically have it, I kind of have an idea as to what to expect for my price. I have an idea as to what to expect for my quantity. For example, if I were to go through and calculate a quantity exchanged of 45, this should be a red flag. right? If we look at our graph here, we have 0, we have 30. This should not be 45. 45 should be somewhere out here. So, okay, I should be getting some value of quantity exchanged close in between 0 and 30. If I got my scale somewhat okay, I should be getting a value closer to 30 than to 0. So, right, this can kind of help us a little bit. Same thing for my price, right? I can look at this and say, okay, price of 10, price of 90. I should be getting some value of price in between 10 and 90. And again, if my scale is somewhat accurate, it should be closer to 10 than it should be to 90. So all things that we can utilize this graph for to help us as we go through our math. So, okay, that being said, let's go and take a look at the math. So we have our equations. What do we do? We have four unknowns. We have two prices. We have a quantity supplied. We have a quantity demanded. Looks like there's a problem here. But what we can do is we can take advantage of the fact that at this quantity, well, price from supply, price from demand are exactly the same. Or looking at it the other way, at this price, quantity supplied and quantity demanded are one and the same. So that is, hey, this price is the same as that price. And if this price equals 90 minus 3Q, and this price is 10 plus Q, and they're the same, well, then I can go like this. I can go price equals price. And, okay, that's price, uh, sorry, price equals price. I already have that. So this guy, that price would be 10 plus Q equals the other price, 90 minus 3Q. Hey, now I have one unknown, Q. I can get these guys together, isolate, and solve for my quantity. So let's go through that. Let's go through that little bit of algebra and figure out what our quantity is. So again, going through this, I don't like negatives. So the first thing I want to do is I want to get rid of this negative 3Q. So I'm going to add 3Q to both sides. So 10, 3Q plus Q is going to be plus 4Q equals 90. Okay, getting that Q by itself, let's subtract 10 from both sides. So 4Q equals 80. And then get the Q by itself, so divide 4 by both sides, and we get Q equals 20. Hey, not so bad, right? Maybe not a perfect scale, but 20 is closer to 30 than it is to 0. So I get my idea that, hey, this is probably looking good. I've probably done okay with my math. There likely is not a mistake. How do I get my price now? Well, to get my price, what I need to do is take my quantity exchanged and throw it back into the line, the linear equation, to get the corresponding price, right? For marginal benefit, marginal cost, maximum willingness to pay, minimum willingness to accept, right? We've actually done this already in that previous video. 
question is, which line do I use? Do I want to work out what the minimum willingness to accept is, or do I want to work out what the maximum willingness to pay is? The answer is it shouldn't matter. We should be able to use either equation, and we should get the exact same result. It's always a good way to double check your work if you're unsure, to put this 20 into both, and ensure you get the same answer. In my case, I'm just going to use a supply just to make it easy. So price equals 10 plus my quantity. My quantity was 20. So price equals 30. Okay. So there we go. Price equals 30. Closer to 10 than it is to 90. Again, scale is probably not perfect, but I got my result. We could double check it. I said, oh, let's just use supply, but let's double check it. Let's throw this 20 into my demand. So price equals 90 minus 3 times 20. Oh, what's 3 times 20? 60. Price equals 90 minus 60. That gives me a price of 30. So they both agree. Quantity, same supply, same demand at this point. So good. We haven't made any mistakes along the way. We've solved for equilibrium price and quantity. Awesome. Okay, we'll be doing quite a bit of this as we go through. So, good kind of bit here. What we can do, scroll down. Let's give us a few different ones to play around with to practice. We're gonna have price equals 100 plus 5Q. Price equals 50. Uh, sorry. Uh, price equals 1600 minus 5q and then we'll take a look over here we'll go price equals 50 plus 4q and price equals 100 minus q so for each of these let's graph them and let's solve for the equilibrium price and quantity i'm not going to go through the full steps of each one this is something that you should be comfortable working through Ideally, this is early high school algebra, but it might be a while for some of you, right? This isn't something that you do in your day-to-day -day life, unless you're me. Um, so something that you need to go and make sure that you're comfortable working through this, solving for equilibrium quantity, solving for equilibrium price, and being able to graph each one. Pause the video. Otherwise, the answers are going to pop up in three, two, one. Okay, so we have our answers for each one. Hopefully you're able to work that out. Hopefully you really get the same results here. Get kind of similar looking graphs, right? And everything worked out well. Follow-up questions that we could look at with this, right? Is I could say, hey, what is the elasticity of demand between, and I could let you give you two points. What is the elasticity of supply? And again, I can give you two points. Very similarly, I could say, hey, What's the marginal effect of the demand curve? What's the marginal effect of the supply curve? And work through it like that. So again, these are things we worked through in those last videos. We worked through them in the previous videos. That doesn't mean they're gone. In fact, they will very much be carrying forward with us, especially as we move on into looking at price controls in a future video. So really make sure that you're still okay working with elasticities. Make sure you're still okay with that idea of the marginal effect. If you're lost on that, Please go back, watch that previous video on those, and make sure that you're good with them before we carry on too much farther. If you had any issues calculating this, please feel free to reach out to me. This is really going to be a big part as we move through calculating our supply and our demand. For a second, though, we're going to leave the math behind us. We're going to move on to what's known as our comparative statics, and we're going to be taking a look at what happens as... One of these things that we have presumed constant, we have some shock, we have that push to our system, we go from an equilibrium to a disequilibrium, and we're going to talk about our adjustment process, how the market adjusts from a disequilibrium to a new equilibrium. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so here we have our market, we're in equilibrium, and I've listed for each one there all of the determinants that we presumed were constant in drawing the supply and the demand curve. That is, well, just because there's a bit of chicken scratch there, let's read these out. So what do we have? For our supply curve to just start off, well, the supply curve is being drawn for a change in own price, right? So as own price changes, we have the change in our quantity supplied. And we draw the supply curve presuming 
price of other goods are constant. So that is price of our production complements and production substitutes, they're all the same. Input prices are fixed. So wages, cost of raw materials, cost of capital, all that is fixed. Technology. Technology, weather was the other side of that, natural um, disasters, all of those, those are fixed. Number of suppliers, how many people are providing to this market? Well, again, fixed. And finally, expectations, what the producer's expectations of the future are, those are fixed. Moving to the demand side. Well, again, our demand is being drawn for a change in own price resulting in a change in quantity demanded. And that demand curve is being drawn given fixed tastes and preferences. Being drawn given change in, sorry, being drawn given a fixed price of other goods. So again, complements or substitutes of consumption in this case, fixed, right? Centris paribus, everything else in the world is fixed. Income, we're presuming this is being drawn for a fixed income, fixed expectations for the future, and fixed population. All of that stuff is one and the same. It is fixed. The only thing changing is the product's own price in drawing this. Okay, our comparative statics. What happens if all of a sudden we do have a change, right? What if one of these other determinants of supply or determinants of demand changes? What begins to happen? What, what's our new outcome, right? So let, let's work through this. So let's start off, let's consider the market for cars. So this is representing the market for cars. We have our initial price, P prime, and our initial price, uh, quantity exchanged, Q prime. Suddenly, the cost of steel goes up. So cost of steel goes up. Keep in mind, cars are made out of steel. So this is an input. We have all, all of a sudden a change in the price of inputs. So what we now have to do is we have to hold everything else in the world constant. We have to allow this change in price of inputs to happen and then fix it at its new one and allow everything to adjust. So, okay, change in the price of an input. Well, we already identified that. That is going to influence our supply. And then we have to identify, okay, is my supply going to increase? That is for this fixed price, am I going to want to produce more cars given a higher cost of inputs or produce less cars given a higher cost of inputs? Well, hopefully in that you correctly identified that we are going to want to produce less cars given our higher cost of inputs. So our quantity would fall. As our quantity falls, right, this would be our quantity supplied falls, we get our new supply curve that is passing through, yeah, we can do a little bit better than that. Passing through right there, we'll call this guy supply prime for my new one. That is my supply has shifted to the left, it has decreased. Okay, so we've had this change. But now notice that what was used to be our quantity exchange, right, this initial price, is now just my quantity demanded. At this price point, this guy here, this is just my quantity supplied. That is, given this change in the cost of steel, I now find myself in excess demand, right? You and I, we don't care that the price of steel has gone up. We still want the same amount of cars given this price. This has been a supplier problem. This has been the producer's problem. They need to react. So, okay, we have them react. They decrease their supply. They decrease the amount they could supply, giving us excess demand. Problem now, we want cars. We want cars, right? We want this many, but only this many are available to us. What do we do? Well, in order to get the vehicle that we want, we begin to bid up the price. As we bid up that price to kind of guarantee us the vehicle that we want, the market price begins to adjust and prices begin to rise. As prices rise, we move along our demand curve. As prices rise, producers move along their supply curve. 
and we wind up at a new equilibrium. I'll use a brand new color to identify this. We get our new market price and we get our new quantity exchange. We'll go Q double prime and P double prime. So that is, if we want to take a look at what the impact of this change in input was, well, given this, we had our price going up, right? Well, I guess first, supply went left, causing the price to rise. As the price rose, we went from an initial quantity exchanged right here, quantity exchanged fell to Q double prime. So we could say that our quantity fell. So impact of this change in inputs, higher cost of input causes a decrease in supply, a rise in price, and a fall in our quantity exchanged. Okay, well, let's take a look for another one. Let's take a look at another situation here. Okay, so in this case, let's presume we're taking a look at the market for apples. And again, we have all of our determinants of supply listed. We have all of our determinants of demand listed. And let's suppose that in this case here, all of a sudden some new information pops up. And this new information is that, hey, an apple a day will keep the doctor away. This is revolutionary. All of a sudden, if you just have an apple a day, you can be healthier and it will keep the doctor away because I guess the doctor is evil and you don't want to be near them. Or right? Maybe it's the other side. Maybe it's more like you don't want to go to the doctor because that means you're sick. Okay. Either way, this is brand new information. This was never before known. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, if we eat apples, we can be healthier. What does this impact, right? We have to take this information. We need to rationalize it and we need to figure out which determinant is being impacted and which curve is being affected as a result of this. Okay. In this case here, Pause it if you haven't figured this out. Try to work it out yourself. If not, here we go. What happens? I would say that this guy here, this is impacting our tastes, right? Our tastes are preferences for apples. All of a sudden, hey, we're finding out apples make us healthier. Hey, we want to be healthy. We don't want to be seeing the doctor because we're sick all the time. So my tastes, my preferences for apples have changed. Given this change in taste and preferences, all else constant, citrus paribus, fixed price, Am I going to want to consume more apples at this price or fewer apples at this price? Well, hopefully you figured out that, hey, if I'm all of a sudden having an increased taste and increased preference for apples, that my quantity demanded for apples will increase. So quantity demanded for apples increases. That is, all of a sudden, I'm going to have my new demand curve as such. Right? You can essentially imagine that this old demand curve has ceased existing. It is gone. It no longer exists. It is no longer there. It has moved. It has shifted to the right. Given this change, well, okay, here's my new quantity demanded. What used to be my equilibrium quantity exchanged is now just my quantity supplied. So I have this new excess demand for apples. Given this excess demand for apples, what begins to happen? Well, we really want apples to keep the doctors away. So what do we do? Well, we go to the store, we look for apples, they're all gone. But hey, that guy has a ton of apples in his cart. Maybe you can offer him a little bit more than what they paid in order to get some for you too. Right? Ultimately, there's some mechanism that happens where you begin to bid up the price of apples. As you begin to bid up the price of apples, well, Bid up the price, right? As that price gets bid up, your quantity demanded begins to fall. You don't quite want as many as the price rises. As the price of apples goes up, our producers, they're more willing to supply apples, so quantity supply rises. These two go in tandem, giving us our new quantity exchange. Again, I'll call that Q double prime. And what we notice is that in relation to the original equilibrium point, our quantity exchanged has risen. What about the market price? What has happened to market price? Well, in relation to the original market price, we now have P double prime. So our price has risen. So in this case here, we had a favorable change in our tastes and preferences. 
that was an impact to our demand, right? That caused our demand to go right. As our demand went right, our quantity exchanged increased. Now let's go like this, quantity, quantity exchanged increased and our price of the good increased as well. So we can work through these kind of situations in this fashion. Let's do, let's do one more final one. Okay, let's take a look at this example here. This one here, if we recall back to early March 2020 at the height of the pandemic, well, I shouldn't say the height of the pandemic, things have gotten much worse since then, but at the start of the pandemic, what was happening was all of a sudden we had this run on toilet paper, right? We had all of a sudden everybody, for whatever reason, they had this expectation that they were not going to be getting toilet paper in the future, and so there was this massive run on toilet paper altogether. Well, you also recall that there was a lot of news coming out, there was a lot of criticism going on, that some companies were actually raising the price of toilet paper. And people were losing their minds. They were going, how can you be doing this? How can you be raising the price, profiteering off of toilet paper? Well, let's take a look at what happened. Let's take a look at why that was actually just the normal market response to this. So all of a sudden, everybody thinks that we're going to run out of toilet paper for some reason. They think that they're not going to be able to get it. So if you don't think you can get toilet paper in the future, what do you want to do today? Right? What is all this influencing? Well, this is influencing my expectations. Right? If I don't think I can get it in the future and I have something I'm going to need in the future, I'm going to stockpile it today. So I have this increase in expectations. The result is for a fixed price, for a fixed quantity, all of a sudden, all else constant, my quantity demanded for toilet paper has increased. As my quantity demanded for toilet paper is increased, I find myself here. That's not on one of my curves. That's because my demand curve has shifted to the right. So demand has increased. It's shifted to the right. I have my new demand curve. Once again, in this case here, we have our excess demand. That is, we really want toilet paper, but we can't find it anywhere. So what do we begin to do? Well, we begin to find some of the people who stockpiled it and we begin to say to them, hey, I'll pay a little bit extra if I can take one of yours because I really need some toilet paper. As we go through this, well, eventually firms are smart and they're like, hey, wait a minute. Why should we be getting essentially these scalpers of toilet paper make profit off of it when we could just raise our price and be able to match? So what begins to happen is because you were willing to pay more and because you were bidding up the price by paying scalpers, scalpers of toilet paper, kind of comical to think of, what begins to happen is, well, at that higher price, you begin to have lower and lower quantity demanded. The firm is like, hey, we'll just produce more at that price. We can do that. And we get back to equilibrium such that as we get back to equilibrium, we have a new quantity. We have a new price such that price rose. And in relation to the initial quantity exchanged, our quantity exchange rose as well. But we face this new higher price. So, okay, we have to deal with that as well. Okay, we've taken a look at a few different examples. We've taken a look at three different potential shocks and how they worked through. The big thing is to be able to think through a bunch of different shocks in the world around you, trying to explain kind of why certain prices have changed, which of these determinants have been impacted, did we say witness a price increase? Did we witness a price decrease? What has happened? Can you break this down into its parts? Um, okay, I said that that was the last one. Let's actually go through one more. This is one that tends to be rather difficult altogether. And let's take a look at this. Okay, let's presume that once again, we are dealing with the market for cars. And let's presume that in this market for cars, all of a sudden that we have a change in another good. That is, all of a sudden, the price of trucks drops. And we want to analyze, okay, what happens given this change in the price of trucks? Keeping in mind, price of trucks is another good, right? So price of others, but oh, oh, we also have price of others down here. And we have this situation occurring where, hey, trucks are both a substitute of production 
but they're also a substitute of consumption, right? They fit on both sides here. So what's going to happen in this case? Well, okay, you'll often see this question come up one of three ways. You'll see it come up, which is I'm going to go through it here, which is generic. Hey, price of trucks has changed. What's happened? In other cases, I'm going to say, hey, we have a change in the price of trucks, which primarily affects demand or primarily affects the consumption of cars. I will also say, or rather instead, I could say, hey, price of trucks falls, which primarily affects the production of cars. Right? In those latter two cases, what I want you to do is I want you to just focus in on how it affects the supply or how it affects the demand, right? presuming that it affects one more than the other. That's those latter two cases where I'm saying, hey, primarily affects the consumption, primarily affects the production. In this case, though, we'll just look at it generically. We'll look at how it would affect them both, presuming that this change in the price of trucks is significant enough to change both curves. So let's take a look at what's happening here. And this, this does get complicated. So we have to make an assumption. And our first assumption is, and this assumption will always be given to you, is that we are going to have a larger demand effect. And we'll see why this assumption is important in a minute. But in this case here, we're going to presume that this change in the price of trucks is going to affect our demand curve more than it's going to affect our supply curve. We'll see in a second why this is important, and we'll work through that. So, okay, let's work through our supply situation first. So, for supply, what's happening? Price of trucks goes down. So, okay, if price of trucks goes down, what happens to my quantity supply of trucks? Well, law of supply, price and quantity are positively related. So if price of trucks is down, quantity supplied of trucks is down as well. Cetris paribus, so no change in the price of cars. Keeping in mind our production possibility frontier, I have a trade-off between cars and trucks. So if I'm producing fewer trucks, I'm going to be producing more cars. So, okay, Cetris paribus. Quantity supplied of cars increases. So all of a sudden I find myself out over there. Boom, there's my new quantity supplied. Shift this supply curve as such. There's my new supply. Okay, we could work out how we're adjusting down there, but let's wait. We also have the impact on our demand curve. So let's, let's talk about the impact on our demand curve next. Okay, price of trucks went down, quantity demanded of trucks then. Well, what's going on here? Quantity demanded of trucks, that's gonna be going up, right? Law of demand, these two are inversely related. Okay, our market that we're interested in, Cetris Paribus, price of cars is ineffected, right? Price of cars, solid white line. But, hey, if I'm buying more trucks, these guys are substitutes, right? I have my budget line between cars and trucks. So if I'm buying more trucks, I'm buying fewer cars. And in this case, I'm saying that this is going to affect my demand in a larger way. So, right, if we take a look, okay, if we did that distance for the impact on supply, I'm going to be doing, boom, okay, that distance again, and then let's go a little bit farther. That is the impact that I'm going to have on my demand curve. I'm just really exaggerating this. And boom, there's my new demand. Deep run. Okay. If we take a look at this, what's, what's happening? So essentially our old lines are gone. It's hard to get rid of them. Same with if you're doing this on paper. So we'll just ignore them. We're now looking at S prime and D prime. So I have a quantity demanded. I have a quantity supplied. And what's going to be the impact here? Well, excess supply. All of a sudden, I have all of these cars sitting around on my lot that I can't sell. So what do I do? I begin to lower the price of cars. As I lower the price of cars, well, the demand begins to creep back up. And we move along in subsequent production runs along our supply curve, we move along our demand curve, 
and we wind up at our new equilibrium of d prime s prime and we have my new quantity exchanged and my new oh let's make that a straight line we have my new price there we go price now we'll go price double prime q double prime being my new equilibrium occurring okay so why did I have to go through that whole ordeal, right? Double shift, these guys get messy. Why did I have to go through this whole ordeal of saying that I had a larger demand effect? Well, let's take a look why. Keep in mind what happened. We said that price fell and quantity exchange fell. What if, what if we worked through that in the reverse way such that we had a smaller demand effect? So let's take a look at that, smaller demand effect. So smaller, let's just right over top of that, as ugly as that looks, a smaller demand effect. So, okay, if that was our supply effect, let's say that our demand effect was small. There we go. So not nearly as far being shifted for the same price. If I draw this in now, there we go. There's my new demand line, D prime. Same thing, we're going to adjust down to our new equilibrium, S prime, D prime, right? Keep in mind, we have the same outcome. We have this quantity supplied. We have that quantity demanded. But if you notice, this whole where we're going to adjust down to, dropping price, dropping price, dropping price. Dropping price means more quantity demanded. We're going to end up down over there now. Look what happened to my quantity demanded. If my demand effect was smaller, my quantity exchange just slightly rose. What happened to my price? Well, my price, my price still fell. That was going to be the same effect irrespective of our relative sizes, but this whole assumption here as to which effect is bigger is going to determine whether or not my quantity exchange in the end increased or decreased. In this scenario, smaller demand effect, quantity increases, larger demand effect, that was our previous case, quantity decreased. So anytime we have a double shift, there will always be some kind of language saying we have a larger effect on the demand, we have a larger effect on the supply, or smaller effect on the demand, smaller effect on the supply. There will be some language about the magnitude of one relative to the other. Because we need that in order to we need that assumption in order to have a concrete outcome. Otherwise, it becomes ambiguous as to what the impact will be on our quantity exchange. So something to keep in mind, we won't be looking at too many double shifts in this course, but they will show up occasionally. Occasionally they will occur. Mostly will be one directional shocks. Okay, so that does us for our video on the market for our determination of price, this whole idea of equilibrium price and where they come from. Uh, by the end of this, right, you should have been able to identify, you should be able to explain our adjustment process, how we get from a disequilibrium to an equilibrium. You should be able to determine who influences that. When we have excess supply, it's the supplier that influences it. When we have excess demand, it's the demander that influences it. We should also be able to identify and compute the equilibrium price and quantity exchange. So identifying it is just saying, oh, look, there it is. There it is where our supply and demand intersect. Computing it, that's that math skill that we looked at where we had our actual equation for the line and we can actually solve and compute, hey, price is equal to this, quantity is equal to that. Finally, the final kind of objective of this video is to identify a new equilibrium following a shock utilizing our comparative statics. So that is, again, taking a look at our determinants of supply, our determinants of demand, reading a news item, reading something that has happened, and determine, okay, what curve is shifting? Where is our new equilibrium? How does this work out? How does it influence our price? How does it influence our quantity? And working through that to the end. So our big three objectives. If you have any questions about these, if any parts are still unclear, feel free to reach out, email, or post to the frequently asked questions on D2L.